The Battle of Taranto took place on the night of 11 the 12th of November 1940 during the Second World War between British naval forces under Admiral Andrew Cunningham and Italian naval forces under Admiral Inigo Campioni. The Royal Navy launched the first all-aircraft ship-to-ship naval attack in history, employing 21 ferry sawfish biplane torpedo bombers from the aircraft carrier HMS Illustrious in the Mediterranean Sea. The attack struck the battle fleet of the Regia Marina at anchor in the harbour of Taranto, using aerial torpedoes despite the shallowness of the water. The success of this attack augured the ascendancy of naval aviation over the big guns of battleships. According to Admiral Cunningham, Taranto, and the night of 11 the 12th of November 1940, should be remembered forever as having shown once and for all that in the fleet air arm the Navy has its most devastating weapon. Chapter 1, Origins Since long before the First World War, the Italian Regia Marina's first squadron had been based at Taranto, a port city on Italy's southeast coast. In the interwar period, the British Royal Navy developed plans to counter the Italian Navy in the event of a war in the Mediterranean. Plans for the capture of the port at Taranto were considered as early as the Italian invasion of Abyssinia in 1935. After Italy's entry into World War II in 1940, British and Italian forces in North Africa engaged each other in the Western Desert Campaign. Italian troops based in Libya required a supply line from Italy. British troops, based in Egypt, suffered from much greater supply difficulties. Before Italy entered the war, British convoys had travelled across the Mediterranean, from Gibraltar via Malta to Egypt. However, the threat from the Italian Navy and Air Force made this very difficult. Instead, British ships steamed around the Cape of Good Hope, up the east coast of Africa, and then through the Suez Canal to reach Alexandria. Following the concept of a fleet in being, the Italians usually kept their warships in harbour and were unwilling to seek battle with the Royal Navy on their own, also because any ship lost larger than a destroyer could not be replaced. The Italian fleet at Taranto was powerful, six battleships, seven heavy cruisers, two light cruisers and eight destroyers. This made the threat of a sortie against British shipping a serious problem. During the Munich crisis of 1938, Admiral Sir Dudley Pound, the commander of the British Mediterranean fleet, was concerned about the survival of the aircraft carrier HMS Glorious in the face of Italian opposition in the Mediterranean, and ordered his staff to re-examine all plans for attacking Taranto. He was advised by Lumley Lister, the captain of Glorious, that his fairy swordfish biplane torpedo bombers were capable of a night attack. Indeed, the fleet air arm was then the only naval aviation arm with such a capability. Pound took Lister's advice and ordered training to begin. Security was kept so tight there were no written records. Just a month before the war began, Pound advised his replacement, Admiral Andrew Cunningham, to consider the possibility. This came to be known as Operation Judgment. The fall of France and the consequent loss of the French fleet in the Mediterranean made redress essential. The older carrier, HMS Eagle, on Cunningham's strength, was ideal, possessing a very experienced air group, composed entirely of the obsolescent sawfish aircraft. Three Sea Gladiator fighters were added for the operation. Firm plans were drawn up after the Italian army halted at Sidi Barani, which freed up the British Mediterranean fleet. Operation Judgment was just a small part of the overarching Operation MB8. It was originally scheduled to take place on 21 October 1940, Trafalgar Day, but a fire in an auxiliary fuel tank of one swordfish led to a delay. 60 Imp Gal auxiliary tanks were fitted in the observer's position on torpedo bombers, the observer taking the air gunner's position, to extend the operating range of the aircraft enough to reach Taranto, this minor fire spread into something more serious that destroyed two swordfish. Eagle then suffered a breakdown in her fuel system, so she was removed from the operation. When the brand new carrier HMS Illustrious, based at Alexandria, became available in the Mediterranean, she took on board five swordfish from Eagle and launched the strike alone. The complete naval task force, commanded by now Rear Admiral Lister, who had originated the plan of attack on Taranto, 
consisted of illustrious, the heavy cruisers HMS Berwick and York, the light cruisers HMS Gloucester and Glasgow, and the destroyers HMS Hyperion, Ilex, Hasty, and Havelock. The 24 attack swordfish came from 813, 815, 819, and 824 naval air squadrons. The small number of attacking warplanes raised concern that judgment would only alert and enrage the Italian navy without achieving any significant results. Illustrious also had fairy fulmer fighters of 806 naval air squadron aboard to provide air cover for the task force, with radar and fighter control systems. Half of the swordfish were armed with torpedoes as the primary strike aircraft, with the other half carrying aerial bombs and flares to carry out diversions. These torpedoes were fitted with duplex magnetic slash contact exploders, which were extremely sensitive to rough seas, as the attacks on the German battleship Bismarck later showed. There were also worries the torpedoes would bottom out in the harbor after being dropped. The loss rate for the bombers was expected to be 50%. Several reconnaissance flights by Martin Marylands of the RAF's No. 431 General Reconnaissance Flight flying from Malta confirmed the location of the Italian fleet. These flights produced photos on which the intelligence officer of Illustrious spotted previously unexpected barrage balloons, the attack plan was changed accordingly. To make sure the Italian warships had not sortied, the British also sent over a short Sunderland flying boat on the night of the 11th of November, just as the carrier task force was forming up off the Greek island of Kefalonia, about 170 nautical miles from Taranto Harbour. This reconnaissance flight alerted the Italian forces in southern Italy, but since they were without any radars, they could do little but wait for whatever came along. The Regia Marina could conceivably have gone to sea in search of any British naval force, but this was distinctly against the naval philosophy of the Italians between January 1940 and September 1943. The complexity of Operation MB8, with its various forces and convoys, succeeded in deceiving the Italians into thinking only normal convoying was underway. This contributed to the success of judgment. The base of Taranto was defended by 101 anti aircraft guns and 193 machine guns and was usually protected against low flying aircraft by barrage balloons, of which only 27 were in place on the 11th of November, as strong winds on the 6th of November had blown away 60 balloons. Capital ships were also supposed to be protected by anti torpedo nets but 12,800 meters of netting was required for full protection, and only one-third of that was rigged before the attack due to a scheduled gunnery exercise. Moreover, these nets did not reach the bottom of the harbor, allowing the British torpedoes to clear them by about 60 centimeters. Chapter 2 – Attack The first wave of 12 aircraft, led by Lieutenant Commander Kenneth Hooch Williamson Iron of 815 Squadron, left illustrious just before 2100 hours hours on the 11th of November 1940, followed by a second wave of nine about 90 minutes later. Of the second wave, one aircraft turned back as its auxiliary fuel tank detached from the aircraft ensuring the aircraft would not be able to complete the trip, and one launched, 20 minutes late, after requiring emergency repairs to damage following a minor taxiing accident, so only eight made it to the target. The first wave, which consisted of six swordfish armed with torpedoes, two with flares and four 250 pounds bombs, and four with six bombs, was split into two sections when three of the bombers and one torpedo bomber strayed from the main force while flying through thin clouds. The smaller group continued to Taranto independently. The main group approached the harbor at Mar Grande at 22.58. Sixteen flares were dropped east of the harbor, then the flare dropper and another aircraft made a dive bombing attack to set fire to oil tanks. The next three aircraft, led by Lieutenant Commander K. Williamson Iron of 815 Squadron, attacked over San Pietro Island, and struck the battleship Conti di Cavour with a torpedo that blasted a 27 feet hole in her side below her waterline. Williamson's plane was immediately shot down by the Italian battleship's anti aircraft guns. The two remaining aircraft in this sub-flight continued, 
dodging barrage balloons and receiving heavy anti-aircraft fire from the Italian warships and shore batteries, to press home an unsuccessful attack on the battleship Andrea Doria. The next sub-flight of three attacked from a more northerly direction, attacking the battleship Litterio, hitting it with two torpedoes and launching one torpedo at the flagship, the battleship Vittorio Veneto, which missed. The bomber force, led by Captain O. Patch R.M., attacked next. They found the targets difficult to identify, but attacked and hit two cruisers moored at Mar Piccolo hitting both with a single bomb each from 1,500 feet, followed by another aircraft that straddled four destroyers. The second wave of eight aircraft, led by Lieutenant Commander J.D. Hale of 819 Squadron, was now approaching from a northerly direction towards the Mar Grand Harbor, with two of the four bombers also carrying flares, the remaining five carrying torpedoes. Flares were dropped shortly before midnight. Two aircraft aimed their torpedoes at Litterio, one of which hit. One aircraft, despite having been hit twice by anti-aircraft fire, aimed a torpedo at Vittorio Veneto but the torpedo missed. Another aircraft hit the battleship Duilio with a torpedo, blowing a large hole in her hull and flooding both of her forward magazines. The aircraft flown by Lt. G. Bailey Iron was shot down by anti-aircraft fire from the heavy cruiser Gorizia following the successful attack on Litterio, the only aircraft lost from the second wave. The final aircraft to arrive on the scene 15 minutes behind the others made an unsuccessful dive-bombing attack on one of the Italian cruisers despite heavy anti-aircraft fire, then safely returned to Illustrious, landing at 02 colon 39 dot of the two aircraft shot down. The pilot and observer of the first, Lt. Commander K. Williamson, and Lt. N. Scarlett respectively, were taken prisoner. As for the pilot and observer of the second aircraft, Lt. G. E. Bailey and Lt. H. Slaughter, they were both killed. The Italian battleships suffered significant damage. Conti di Cavour had a 12 m x 8 m hole in the hull, and permission to ground her was withheld until it was too late so her keel touched the bottom at a deeper depth than intended. Twenty-seven of the ship's crew were killed and over one hundred more wounded. In the end, only her superstructure and main armament remained above water. She was subsequently raised, partially repaired and transferred to Triessa for further repairs and upgrades, but a changed situation put these works in low priority. She was still undergoing repairs when Italy surrendered so she never returned to full service. Duilio had only a slightly smaller hole, and was saved by running her aground. Litterio had considerable flooding caused by three torpedo hits. Despite underwater protection, the damage was extensive, although actual damage to the ship's structures was relatively limited. Casualties were 32 crewmen killed and many wounded. She was holed in three places, once on the port side, and twice on the starboard side and 12 meters times 9 meters. She too was saved by running her aground. Despite this, in the morning, the ship's bows were totally submerged. Dot Italian defenses fired 13,489 shells from the land batteries, while several thousand were fired from the ships. The anti-aircraft barrage was formidable, having 101 guns and 193 machine guns. There were also 87 balloons, but strong winds caused the loss of 60 of them. Only 4.2 kilometers of anti-torpedo nets were actually fielded around the ships, up to 10 meters in depth, while the need was for 12.8 kilometers. There were also 13 aerophonic stations and 22 searchlights. Dennis Boyd, commanding officer HMS Illustrious, stated in his after-action report, it is notable that the enemy did not use the searchlights at all during either of the attacks. Litterio was repaired with all available resources and was fully operational again within four months, while restoration of the older battleships proceeded at a much slower pace. In all, the swordfish attack was made with just 20 aircraft. Two Italian aircraft were destroyed on the ground by the bombing, and two unexploded bombs hit the cruiser Trento, and the destroyer Libecchio. Near misses damaged the destroyer Pesigno. Meanwhile, X-Force cruisers attacked an Italian convoy. 
This force had three cruisers and two tribal class destroyers. Just past midnight, they met and destroyed four Italian merchantmen, damaging the torpedo boat Fabrizi, while the heavily outgunned auxiliary cruiser ROM 3 fled. Cunningham and Lister wanted to strike Taranto again the next night with swordfish, one wag in the pilot's room remarked, they only asked the light brigade to do it once. Dash but bad weather prevented the action. Chapter 3 Aftermath The Italian fleet lost half of its capital ships in one night, the next day, the Regia Marina transferred its undamaged ships from Taranto to Naples to protect them from similar attacks, until the defences at Taranto were brought up to adequate levels to protect them from further attacks of the same kind. Repairs to Litterio took about four months, to Duilio seven months, Conti di Cavour required extensive salvage work and her repairs were incomplete when Italy surrendered in 1943. Cunningham wrote after the attack, The Taranto show has freed up our hands considerably and I hope now to shake these damned ITs up a bit. I don't think their remaining three battleships will face us and if they do I'm quite prepared to take them on with only two. Indeed, the balance of power had swung to the British Mediterranean fleet which now enjoyed more operational freedom, when previously forced to operate as one unit to match Italian capital ships, they could now split into two battle groups, each built around one aircraft carrier and two battleships. Nevertheless, Cunningham's estimate that Italians would be unwilling to risk their remaining heavy units was quickly proven wrong. Only five days after Taranto, Campione sorted with two battleships, six cruisers and fourteen destroyers to successfully disrupt a mission to deliver aircraft to Malta. The follow-up to this operation led to the Battle of Cape Spartivento on 27 November 1940. Two of the three damaged battleships were repaired by mid-1941 and control of the Mediterranean continued to swing back and forth until the Italian armistice in 1943. The attack on Taranto was avenged a year later by the Italian Navy in its raid on Alexandria, when the Mediterranean fleet of the Royal Navy was attacked using midget submarines, severely damaging HMS Queen Elizabeth, and HMS Valiant. However, measured against its primary task of disrupting Axis convoys to Africa, the Taranto attack had very little effect. In fact, Italian shipping to Libya increased between the months of October 1940, January 1941 to an average of 49,435 tons per month, up from the 37,204 ton average of the previous four months. Moreover, rather than change the balance of power in the central Mediterranean, British naval authorities had failed to deliver the true knockout blow that would have changed the context within which the rest of the war in the Mediterranean was fought. Aerial torpedo experts in all modern navies had previously thought that torpedo attacks against ships must be in water at least 75 feet deep. Taranto Harbour had a depth of only about 39 feet, but the Royal Navy had developed a new method of preventing torpedoes from diving too deep. A drum was attached beneath the nose of the aircraft, from which a roll of wire led to the nose of the torpedo. As it dropped, the tension from the wire pulled up the nose of the torpedo, producing a belly flop rather than a nose dive. Chapter 3 Section 1 – Influence on Pearl Harbor It is likely the Imperial Japanese Navy's staff carefully studied the Taranto raid, during planning for the attack on Pearl Harbor, as both attacks faced similar issues attacking a shallow harbor. Japanese Lieutenant Commander Takeshi Naito, the Assistant Naval Attaché to Berlin, flew to Taranto to investigate the attack first and. Naito subsequently had a lengthy conversation with Commander Mitsuo Fuchida about his observations in October 1941. Fuchida led the Japanese attack on 7 December 1941. More significant, perhaps, was a Japanese military mission to Italy in May 1941. A group of IJN officers visited Taranto and had lengthy discussions with their Italian Navy opposite numbers. However, the Japanese had been working on shallow water solutions since early 1939, with various shallow ports as the notional targets, including Manila, Singapore, Vladivostok, and Pearl Harbor. In the early 1930s, as their Type 91 aerial torpedo entered service, 
the Japanese used a breakaway wooden nose to soften its impact with the water. As early as 1936, they perfected breakaway wooden fins for added aerial stability. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor was a considerably larger operation than Taranto. All six Imperial Japanese fleet carriers, each one equipped with an air wing having over twice the number of planes of any British carrier, took part. It resulted in far more devastation, seven American battleships were sunk or disabled, and several other warships were destroyed or damaged. The U.S. Navy thereafter designed its fleet operations in the Pacific Ocean around its carriers instead of its battleships as capital ships. Battleships were found to be less useful in the expanses of the Pacific than in the confines of the Mediterranean, the older ships were too slow to escort the carriers and were chiefly used as fire support for amphibious operations. <laughs>